So let's look at Matthew 5, 5 and begin right there. And, and here Jesus is saying that what is a Christian? Well, a Christian should be this. This is what it is that has Christ showing through you. And today we're going to be looking at blessed are the meek. And, uh, and it says, blessed are the meek, so they, they will inherit the earth. And I want to first say that what meekness is not. It's not a synonym for weakness. Meekness doesn't mean weakness. It's not being timid. It's not spineless or cowardly. To be meek does not mean that you're a geek. Actually, the word for meek, a picture that describes it, is, is like a process of taming a wild animal, a wild horse. It, it, it reminds me of... Uh, Of a, a, I went to an Amish auction up in Hector once, and uh, there was a, a probably a 10-year-old boy that had these Clydesdale, and he was on this thing that had wheels that he was standing on, and he had two Clydesdales that was three feet taller than he was, and he was buzzing through this campground and around where everyone was doing the auction with, like, not a worry. And these big, huge horses, he had complete control of them. It was like no big deal. It scared the living day, death out of me just standing next to these big boys, you know. But he was so um, sure of himself that it was these wild horses were wild, powerful beings were under control. And it's like sometimes you and I, we can be like a wild stallion with a lot of power and a lot of might from the Lord, but it's power and might that's under control. Some of you may be hard to hear this next thing, so I want you to listen, those who would say that I'm Christ one. We can be meek, but this is how it's demonstrated, which is very difficult for a lot of people to do today. We can be meek with our tongue instead of being harsh. We can be meek with our tongue instead of using it as a weapon. We can be meek with our tongue instead of being critical. We can be meek with our tongue instead of demanding our own choices. We can choose to be gentle and considerate instead of harsh and critical. Meek is allowing even our tongue to put a rudder on it or a, what, a bit on it like you do a mouth and realize that everything that comes out of our mouth is important. Are we seeding life into people, or are we being critical and harsh? Jesus talks about, come to me, and about the living water when he came to the well. And he says, come to me, and you'll thirst no more, and you'll drink from the living water. Well, if we're drinking from living water, then shouldn't that living water be coming out of our mouth and not words of destruction. Tony Dungy is a, now he's uh, one of the guys that are being a, um, a, a commentator on the, on the football games. He was one of the greatest coaches and went to the Super Bowl and won it with the Colts. And a great, great, awesome coach. He was in training camp with 100 football players who were fighting for a place on the football team. And he said two things as he gathered the whole team around him. His voice was low and calm. And he said, you will not hear me swear at you. You will not hear me raise my voice any louder than I'm talking to you right now. And that's how he coached. That's how he led a team. It's, it's like an oxymoron to the whole football environment because most coaches are red in the face, their veins are sticking out, they're yelling and screaming, you know. But that wasn't Tony Dungy's style. And he honored the Lord in everything he did and everything he does today. Tony Dungy is an example of strength under control. He led a team all the way to the Super Bowl, and it wasn't an easy road, but he was calm. He was collected, even in an environment that was not. 
We can be meek in our conversation. We can be meek in our ways when we're hearing gossip from other people, when they're talking about someone else. You can be meek by not even willing to go there. If you're not part of the problem or part of the solution, then you have a choice to not to get involved. What happens so much in our family and at work and in and, and church itself is people come and they, they go like this about something that they're bothered by, and all of a sudden now you take that and you're running that cause for them. And it sometimes wasn't even you that was involved in it. But now you're carrying it, aren't you? It happens everywhere. Unfortunately, it happens in the church a lot also. But you can choose not to go there. And when someone starts saying something to you that you just sense isn't right, your spirit just says, you know, I, I don't want to, you, you can take it to that person, but I just don't want to hear it. Meekness is not being mousy. It speaks up for injustice. It speaks up in doing the right thing. The good Samaritan doing the right thing at the right time. Moses said that he was meek, but he spoke about the injustices and had to come to the king, to the pharaoh, to speak about injustices of the people. We can also show our meekness and demonstrate it with our temper. What about your anger? How quickly does it flare up and you allow it to take over? When, when I talk to somebody and they get all angered, I just kind of walk away. It's almost like talking to a drunk. Because what happens when you get angered, all of a sudden your ego rises and you can't even talk to ego anymore because ego's too high and flighty. It makes no sense they won't be able to receive anything of the conversation. They can just get their anger out. And so many of us Christians carry that, don't we? We fly off the handle and we let anger raise to the place that we can't even reason anymore. So we need to have meekness with our temper. How about your spouse when they're running late? <laughs> I know, you know, that can be pretty difficult, can you? And all of a sudden, the blood pressure is going up higher and higher. But really, the reality that God wants to have one another is that our relationships are more important than being on time. And that's hard. I hate being late for anything. In fact, I was raised, if you're not there 10 minutes early, you're late. You know, so being late to me is I can't, I can't stand it. You know, and sometimes um, Suzanne's on time, but I just hate being late for anything. I don't care what it is. But uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is a love chapter, and it's a great chapter. But it, it, we use it a lot in marriages, but I really believe this love is the agape love that God wants us really to demonstrate to one another. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 7 says this. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Now, let, let me just say this. Let me put, put your own name in there. Say, John, I'll say John is patient. John is kind. Put your own name. It does not envy. John does not envy. John does not boast. John is not proud. Keep going before I get angered. <laughs> Just kidding. Scare the person. Back. John does not dishonor others. John is not self-seeking. John is not easily angered. John keeps no records of wrong. John does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. See, if you put your own name in that, it just means a whole lot more. Can you put your name in that? You know, and, and, and live that way. That's the agape love. God wants us first to, you know, the, the love chapters are in there to show to one another. It wasn't just for marriages, and we see that in weddings a lot. But it's really how we're supposed to treat one another. What's well, one of those one another things? But it's so hard to demonstrate that. Why? It's because hurting people retaliate. Hurting people hurt people. Hurting people, when you're hurting inside, you can't get your mind off yourself, so automatically you're on attack mode anyway. If you're not happy about where you're at in life, if you're not happy what's going on in your family, if you're not happy what's going on at work, and all these things are coming down, and you're carrying all these hurts, 
then, then you're already a bomb ready. You're at the boiling point all, already. There's no peace in your life. There's no control in your life. You're just a bomb ready to go off. And when people are around you, they feel like they're walking on eggshells. Boy, don't look out. You might crack an egg here. And look out if you do. Here it comes. The Bible says vengeance is mine. And that's something that, you know, we can't control a lot of the situations, but we can say, Lord, you can control it. And I thank you that, that those who want to harm me and hurt me, that you said vengeance is mine, and I need to lay that at you and not take it on my own. Because when we take it on your own, things happen, don't they? There was a, a truck stop restaurant, and a bunch of uh, Hell's Angels were, were parked outside in California, and the angels pulled up they went inside to eat and they started picking on a particular drive uh, truck driver and the truck driver didn't respond they came in and they started playing with this food and they kind of hit him alongside the head they started making fun of him and making jokes and they took his drink and drank his drink and they were just being nasty to him they're laughing and carrying on and uh, they were just bullying him the whole time and uh he just got up and left, and uh, the Hell's Angels were talking to each other and making fun, and the waitress came around, and, the tr and he said, that truck driver, they said, that guy isn't much of a man, is he? And the waitress responded back, well, I, sir, I don't, I don't really know about that. Well, and all the ba bikers are laughing and carrying on. He goes, but what I, what I do know is that he's not much of a truck driver either because he just backed over 10 Harleys out in the parking lot as he left. <laughs> There was a Chinese food restaurant owner and a real humble and quiet guy. And these guys came in and they came in every day and, and they would just harass this Chinese. They'd make fun of them. They'd say Chinese joke. They'd call them, you know, all kinds of names. And, you know, and they, were, they would, would never leave a tip. And they just took advantage time and time again of this guy. And they'd go out and they'd break things in the parking lot and and so uh, they came back one day and they said, sir, you know, we know we've been traveling, treating you real bad, and uh, we're going to stop doing that. He goes, uh, oh, no, no more mess with my plate. No, no more break things outside. No, he goes, oh, good, I no more spit in your soup. <laughs> so uh, meekness, I don't know what it has to do with anything. <laughs> but there were good stories. <laughs> meekness is with our submission to authority. It's like that taming of that wild stallion. It's a horse that's submitting to the trainer. And if it chooses to, that trainer can even be, like I said, a young boy or a young girl. It wasn't about who was training, it's about the horse's willingness to submit. There's also delegated authority Delegated authority is something that you have authority that's delegated over you. It's not your choice. I have a district superintendent. That's my boss. I, I have delegated authority. When he comes and says jump, I, I have to jump. I mean, that's even though I, he's not involved in the day-to-day -day activities, I, in submission to that, in submission to my denomination, and I've got... Uh, uh, I've got a lot of freedoms, but I have balances on the outside that I operate in. And, and just like at home, what we do with our teenagers, we, as parents, we put delegated authority and, and we, we put boundaries. And within those boundaries, there's a lot of freedom, but don't step out of those boundaries. And some of us don't know what it is to have delegated. In fact, today in our society, we don't like to submit to any authority, don't we? We want to question authority. It used to be a bumper sticker that was out there. We don't want to submit to teachers. We don't want to submit to officers of the law. We don't want to submit to stoplights that tell us to stop. <laughs> we, don't want to, we don't want to be told anything. Reminds you of a story of, a, of a, these two goldfish that were, were in, the, <laughs> in the thing together. And they saw everybody walking in the living room. And, and the one goldfish looked to the other and said, Man, I can't stand this anymore. We're all closed in here, and, and we can't get out and do anything. We have to stay within this bowl, and they get to walk in and out all the time. And then they said, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to get out of this fishbowl. 
And one day he did. And that's the rest of the story. You know, God gives us boundaries. You know, the Bible, that's right. The Bible helps us to give us boundaries. In the Old Testament, we don't live by a lot, but it gave dietary boundaries. It gave living boundaries. It gave all kinds of boundaries for us to live within. For our protection. For you and I to, to live in a way that would, that, would, that would promise a blessing in our life if we follow the ways of the Lord. Meekness has to do something with our submission to authority. Are you submitted to God's authority? Meekness is, is, is allowing that, that we're like this mold of clay and we're the object and, and God is spinning us and, and the Bible talks about that he's molding us into what he wants us to do and it's his hands and his design. And I believe with all my heart at times that God uses uh, parents to help mold and shape the child. And that's hard work. And it's hard work for a child to submit at times. But that's maturity. That's growth. Once I was lost. Once I was on my own. Once I wanted to control my own life and do my own thing. But now I'm a Christian. Now I'm saved. Now I've been found. Now I've been born anew and born again into a whole nother sphere. I've been born into something that God wants me to be. And now I'm allowing him to use people in my life. It could be a boss. It could be unsaved parents. It could be uh, unsaved people. It could be authorities. It could be even when I'm in prison and, and have to be stuck in a place that I can look at everything that comes my way that's an authority over me, that God, you use that person in my life because I'm really in your hands, God, and you're using these things to make me in the kind of person you want me to be. You're building my character, God, and I submit to you. See, that's authority because once I was lost, but now I'm found. How mature are you? A lot of times as we grow, everything inside us is wanting to scream out our independence, our rebellion. Everything wants to, to blow a cork at times when we come against things that say no or hold us back. But being strength under control is a maturity enough to realize that God is the one that's in the control, and he's the one that's shaping me and molding me. And all I have to learn is that I want to be a part of what God wants me to be. I want to be on an adventure with God and have him use me. And in, 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 uh, I believe it's in James when it talks about as a potter makes, the, you know, do we want to be a clay pot or do we want a piece of, 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 of wood uh, and made of, of wood stuff or do we want to be of precious metals that God would take us out and use us for special, special purposes, for special reasons. What kind of plate do you want to be for God to take and use for his glory and for his kingdom? It takes us to be meek, to submit. We, we, we have to learn to submit to a coach's authority when we're in school, don't we? Young people have to submit to their parents. Many of us don't like at times that even in the church of submitting to pastoral authority. What about in marriage, submitting to one another, submitting to a boss or to a teacher? I believe that God will restore us and rebuild us and, and work in us as we allow ourselves and, and become meek with the people that God has surrounded us about. There's also meekness in our service to others. When we're meek, the fruit of that is seen through our humility. And there's no better way than when we serve. In our society, the trouble is we have an attitude that who can serve me? In a sense, in appearance, we've done an injustice that that we do everything for our kids and we serve them so much and everything they can be involved in, we try to encourage them to be involved because we want to give them better than what we had. And all of a sudden, they grow up and they go into college and they're used to everything being done for them and they go away and it's not that way in the real world.
That's what I love about the mission field. That's what I love even about short-term missions. That's what I like about when we step into other countries and we see what poor is about. We see when having nothing is all about. It gives us a heart of humility to, to be able to say, how, what can I do to put pennies away to be able to serve in a way that I can bring something back and give out of what little means I have because I can serve, I can do something, I can do a little bit. See, that, that's humbleness. That's meekness. That's putting other people more important than yourself. And where, where's this teaching coming from? What, what is Jesus thinking about when he's doing the Sermon on the Mount? What position does he take, and, and how does he learn this himself? Where did Jesus come up with this? I believe he came in it from, from learning Scripture himself. You know, the disciples, their Scripture was the Old Testament. When Jesus quoted Scripture, a lot of the New Testament was quoted right out of the Old Testament. And I believe the, the scripture that Jesus is using here in the Sermon on the Mount, a lot of this stems, especially being meek, is out of Psalm 37. And let's just look at that together and read it together because I believe there's kingdom principle that, that Jesus was living, that, that Jesus wanted to show through his life to the disciples to say that this is, it's not something new that he was sharing with them on the Sermon on the Mount, this is how I want you to live. He's taking principles that that were taught to all the Jewish community and to the boys as they sat down and, and heard from the rabbi. This is kind of the teaching that they would hear. And in Psalms 37, we're going to read 1 through 9. Do not fret because of those who are evil. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious for those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. But trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed. For those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. I want to paint a portrait for you of this scripture verse and pull out some things of what it is to be meek from the scripture. In verse 5, they say they trust in God. <clears throat> they believe that he will, for them, vindicate them when others oppose them, when others come against them. Biblical meekness is, is rooted in the deep confidence that God is for you. He's not against you. God is for you. He's not against you. And so there, there's got to be a trust in God higher than your circumstance. The second thing is that those who are meek, they, they commit their way to God. Well, what does it mean by commit their way? Commit really literally means in the Hebrew to roll, to roll over. Meek people have discovered that God is trustworthy, so they roll their way. They roll their business over. They roll their problems over. They roll their relationships over. They roll unto the Lord the things of their lives, their frustrations, and their fears. They, they turn it over, and a, a lot of times when, when I'm in worship and prayer, I, I envision in my mind with lifting up my burdens, lifting up all those things, the problems, the relationships, the pressure, and I lift it up to the Lord. And like, like, a, like a, a boy, a little boy would do to his daddy, you say, here, daddy, take these things. And daddy grabs those things, and he picks you up in his arms, and then he gives back love. He gives back comfort. He gives back a, a trust, and, a, and a gives you back that place of comfort that, okay, it's going to be okay because daddy's got it. Daddy's got it. I, I can do it now because daddy's got it. 
And a lot of time in worship, I'm communing with God and just receiving back the things he wants to say to me. I don't have to hold on to all those frustrations. You get around people that are negative and negative and negative, and you go, holy smokes, their whole spirit is negative. And it's like, I don't even want to be around that kind of stuff. It takes a rolling over, and that's what they commit their way to God. The, the third thing is they're quiet before God. We see in verse 7, and they wait for him. They discover that God can be trusted. Then they commit their ways to him. And then there's a, a patiently waiting in stillness as the work of God takes place in their lives. And we don't know when. He, we're, you know, we can't dictate what God's going to do, but we can have trust that he's going to take care of things. And there's times that I say, God, this doesn't make sense on this side of heaven, and, and maybe it won't make sense to the other side. I don't understand everything that happens. I can't reason out everything that happens. But if I know that I trust God, then he's got a bigger plan, and I, I'm just in that plan. And I'm just thankful for how he uses me. And I can't dictate uh, anything to God. He's God. I'm not God. <laughs> Watch it. And it doesn't come that we become lazy and do nothing. It means that we're just free from that anxiety, that worry, that, that frenziness that can take place. You know, some people I don't understand, but they move to crisis, to crisis, to crisis. And sometimes I sit back and go, I don't, I don't understand how they can always be in crisis mode. It just, to me, it's like they're going to end up with ulcers and troubles. And, 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 uh, it, and we don't have to be that way. Those who are, are meek, that they have a, a steady and a calmness that comes from knowing that God is omnipotent. Uh, ah, work tongue. Yes, thank you. I had that word. I can't say that word today, but that's all right. But everything that's out there, God's in control of all. And he'll work out things for his best in me. And there's a quiet steadiness and a meekness that, that runs their lives in their unsteady circumstances. We're all going to have unsteady circumstances. You know, it, it, we're all, they're always going to be around because we're in an unsteady world. But there's a steadiness that we have in God. And so when we come back, we don't have to fret. And verse 7 continues that they refrain from anger. They don't fret over the wicked. They're not concerned that even there's unjust things that take place. They patiently and quietly see how God's power and his goodness will work things out in the end. And setbacks and obstacles aren't going aren't, aren't gonna to make them go up and down and produce a bitterness or anger in their own life or an anxiety in their life. See, all those things are common to men, but as Christians and we carry meekness in us, we, we, we can realize that that uh, when we put our trust in God, then we need to put it all in God and allow him to take control of the situation. Meekness has everything to do with God and what we place in God. It doesn't have to do with us. See, it's not what I do to make myself meek. It's putting my trust in God that that's what he's doing with things in my life. And there's a, there's a peaceful freedom that comes by trusting God and rolling my way and things that come my way and then just wait for God to do what he wants to do because meekness has everything to do with what God is doing in our lives. And then the Psalms 37, 11, and I'm ending with this verse, and it says, but the meek, the humble will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Another version says, but the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Well, that, what does prosperity mean? It can mean so many things. It can mean finances. But it can mean so much more. It can mean health. It can mean, it can mean provision from God in so many different ways. When the Egypt uh, were 40 years, when they were in the wilderness, their shoes never wore out. 
their clothes. It doesn't say that they went down and bought a new pair down at Kmart, you know, or had new clothes. It, it said they, they, for 40 years, God provided everything for them. You know, I believe that in times that we stay in that place with God, that he prospers us in ways that we don't even know at times. And we take advantage of it because we don't see all the little ways that he prospers us. But there's a peace that comes and, and, and that comes that as we humble ourselves, we make ourselves meek before God. And I believe that those things that we inherit, this is that you inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. I believe that there's kinds of blessing that comes to our way than when we wait upon the Lord. When living in a mindset of my life is totally surrendered to God, then my life is not my own. So I trust that my life now is in the hands of God. You see, God sought me, and God bought me, and now I live for his kingdom. Can you say that for yourself? Can you say, God sought me, now God has bought me, and now I live for his kingdom. I don't live for my own. I am now an heir because... I've been legally uh, 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 adopted by God. I've been adopted. My inheritance now is is not a a family inheritance that is of this earthly realm, but it's of a kingly realm. And when I live my life that is totally surrendered to God, then my life is not my own anymore. Whatever I gain, whatever my advancement, it's not for me anymore. It's for the kingdom of God. And, and everything I have, I, I really have to have with an open hand for God to use for his kingdom. Now, I'm in stewardship of that, and, and, uh, and I have to take care of the things that God has given to me. But realize that it's God's and not mine. When we're promoted or advanced, ask yourself, What am I to do for God's kingdom in this advancement? What am I to do for God's kingdom for for the the place that I put and he puts you in? When you get that raise and that promotion, is it for the purposes that, that God can advance his kingdom through you? Israel was promoted to the promised land. They they got inheritance, but for what purpose? Do you realize that that God wanted Israel to be examples for the rest of the world to see? how great God is, that they were to be examples for the rest of the world, that those who have a relationship with God. So if we put our our trust and we're leaving in the kingdom, we're we're to be lights in this dark world that God can see how how we live, that there's something should be attractive and a drawing to our lives as we're living out the kingdom principles. So God is still reigning today. And he wants to reign in you, and he wants to reign in me. And all we have to learn is in our meekness, we surrender and become humble to God and let him do the work through us. And then he receives the honor and the glory. So let's stand together. Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell, and I'd like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.